So quick agenda. Today, we're going to go over what Grokware Suite is, um, what it includes, a walkthrough of GrokView, a walkthrough of IOP file utility, and a walkthrough of our TSP control utility, and then any available resources for you. Okay, so let's get into it. What is Grokware Suite? So at Grok, we know their smooth development flow is a productive and happy one, which is why we developed Grokware Suite, our software development kit or SDK. Our SDK contains all the tools you need to connect you, our software, and our software-defined hardware. So with that said, let's get into the Grok software stack. By now, if you've been attending the session since yesterday, which was day one of this workshop, you've seen parts of the software stack already, but let's go through all of what's included in this SDK. So our SDK is comprised of two packages, Grok Developer Tools and Grok Runtime. Grok Developer Tool contains, and hopefully you can see my mouse, Grok Compiler, Grok API, Grok View, the IOP File Utility, and Grok Assembler. So Grok Compiler, as you've already heard um, from Philip Lassen, is our MLIR, or Multi-Level Intermediate Representation-Based Compiler, uh, which we spoke about in the previous Grok Compiler session. Now, Grokflow is our automated tool chain for porting models, and it's essentially a wrapper over our compiler, which Sanjeev spoke about in much more detail in our porting models with Grokflow session. And as you've learned, Grokflow is not included in our SDK, but it's available on GitHub and is open source. So once Grokware Suite is installed, as we've gone over, you can simply follow the Grokflow install guide for instructions on how to install Grokflow. Next, we have Grok API, which is our low-level API for highly custom applications. For all intents and purposes, we've been and will be more focused on Grokflow and the compiler for automated model development, as well as porting to Grok hardware. Moving on to GrokView, GrokView, as you've seen bits and pieces of before, is our visualization and profiler tool used to view your compiled model. The IOP file utility is a command line tool that shows your model's metadata, which we will speak about in more detail later on in this session. And last but not least, we have Grok Assembler, which assembles your compiled models to run on Grok hardware. So moving on to the second package, it's called the Grok Runtime package, and lo and behold, it contains the Grok Runtime that communicates with the Grok chip, which Aviv spoke about in the previous Grok Runtime training session. This package also includes the TSP control utility for card di diagnostics and debugging, which we'll also go over together later. Uh, and don't worry, uh, the previous sessions I've mentioned were recorded, as you know, and will be available on both our Grok YouTube and the ALCX YouTube page. So in this session, we'll mainly focus on the available developer tools, what they are and how to use them. We'll both learn about and play with GrokView, the IOP file utility and the TSP control utility. So let's begin with GrokView. You may have seen this image before, but an important point I want to iterate on is that Grok's architecture is deterministic. Deterministic means predictable and repeatable performance. So with GrokView, you know the exact performance, the total execution time, and power dissipation of your models without even having to run on hardware first. GrokView is our lens into the data flow and execution of AI models on Grok hardware. It visualized our model data moving across Grok chip. So not only is this important from the standpoint of being sure your models will run fast once they're deployed, but it also brings benefit before that where you can see upfront how fast your models will actually run before deployment. Let's think of it this way. So in a traditional system, you develop your model, you compile, you deploy, you run it multiple times to profile it, and then you go back to optimize and recompile and so on, right? With Grok, the flow is different. So you don't need to deploy with hardware. You develop your model, you compile, 
and then immediately use developer tools such as GrokView to see its performance. We tighten the loop and speed up innovation. So with that being said, let's learn how to use GrokView from the point of GrokFlow. So this is also going to be a little bit familiar. Um, in yesterday's porting models with GrokFlow session, Sanjeev went over how to build a GrokView visualization. So for those of you who have access to um, the server, this is a great time to log in and follow along with me if you please, uh, so that we can build a Grok view together. And then different from Sanjeev's session, go over in detail what the different features are. So first and foremost, we are going to activate our Grok flow environment. So I'm going to switch to my terminal. And hopefully, I think you can all see that. We're going to run conda activate grokflow. Now, if you followed along uh, Sanjeev's session yesterday, you should have grokflow already installed and can go ahead and activate your environment. Next, um, we are going to use one of the examples that we have available uh, that come with grokflow to go and edit an example file and build a grok view together. So in today's session, I'm going to go into the grokflow folder, examples, and we're going to use a PyTorch example. So this should be the same for all of you. Um, we all have these same directories that come from the grokflow uh, repository. We have a hello world dot pi example. So at this point, um, you can use an editor of your choice. But if you're following along with me, I'm using Vim. And I'm going to go into this Hello World example. We're going to go down. Um, you learned all about the grokflow grokit function in yesterday's session, which was also recorded for any of you who missed it. So we are going to go into this Grokit function. And we're simply going to add this Grok view flag to it and set it to true. Now, once we set, set it to true, and I'm going to switch between the slides and the terminal here um, just to give you a good visual. We're going to call the Grok view function on our Grok model which in this example is grok underscore model. So we'll do that on the next line. Grok view. And with that, we're done. So we save this file. And the next step is to actually run it. So um, for this system, we're running on Python 3.10. So I'm going to dot in hello world pi. And I'm going to put this dash dash build option. So with Grokflow, I think we've mentioned this before, but let me mention it again. If you run an example or a model without this dash dash build, it will, if it detects um, Grok hardware in your system, Grokflow will automatically go through the entire process of building, uh, compiling your model, and then executing on Grok hardware. So for Right now, I don't want to execute the model because we just want to look at the Grok view, um, which is why I'm using dash dash build, which will only tell Grokflow to build the model and nothing else. So with that, we're going to run that command. And here we have a Grok view link that we can copy and paste into our web browser. Let me move on in the slides. So um, something that you have to do uh, before you can actually paste this into your web browser, um, you don't have to, but you may need to create an SSH tunnel um, for this web browser to work. So I'm going to actually do that right now on my other terminal that I have open, link to my server. I'm going to run this, and then I'm going to copy and paste that GrokView link so that we can take a look at it. Um, I will mainly be going through the slides that I've screenshot the different Grok view features that I want to talk about. But if you're following along with me, um, 
at this point, you may feel free to look at that GrokView web browser as I talk. So let's just copy that. Go back here, and I think you can see my full screen. There we have it. So this is for the PyTorch Hello World example that we have. We have successfully built a GrokView together. So now I want to go over all of the features, the different modes that it has, so you have a better overview of what GrokView is and what you can do with it. Okay, so for nav navigating GrokView, uh, the first thing that we look at when we launch that web browser is the settings on the top left corner. Um, I've highlighted throughout these slides uh, all of the features that I'll be talking about in the grok orange um, color that we have. So the settings are in the top left. You, here you can switch between four different modes, which are stats, schedule, container, and streams mode. We will go over those in more detail soon. Uh, the bottom left right below that is the program. So this shows your model name that's loaded into Grok view and the total cycle time for the model. Um, when in different views, it'll give you different information. Uh, so when we go into schedule view, um, we will see that when you select a specific instruction, you'll have more information provided here, which I will show later. On the right hand over here, we have what's what we call an outline. So this is only visible in the schedule container and streams mode. Um, and in this screenshot, I have us on the schedule mode. Uh, and this shows your hierarchy of your program, which I will go into in more detail. And last but not least, the middle window that you have here is just the main window. This will change depending on the mode that you select in GrokView. So far, um, and I may have forgotten to say this at the beginning, if you have any questions, please either type them in chat. I think I can see the QA tool as well, um, or unmute and let me know. Okay, so moving on, we have here the outline view that will be on the right hand side um, for the schedule, container, and streams modes. So here, uh, just a few UI features I'm going to go over very quickly. You have a collapse all. Um, option so this will fully collapse the outline and display only the root container that we have um, we have a find by name where you can use the find field to filter for any particular container names uh, from within the outline and i will go over um, the container mode that will uh, shed a better brighter light on what these containers actually are we have column resizing. Um, so when you go into any particular view, you can just grab the vertical border uh, of the outline or even the uh, settings uh, left-hand side and just resize um, for however you like. And then we have a lock in view. So when we go into container mode, you can just click on a container name to lock in the view so that it stays that way as you navigate around. Okay. So the first mode out of the four that we're going to talk about is the stats mode. This is actually, um, if you followed along with me, it's that first landing page that we land on once we open up a Grok view. So this is called stats mode and it displays the statistics about your program, including the number of cycles required to complete, instruction count, utilization of your hardware and the power profile. So here in utilization, um, this is actually a moving average of the number of instructions that recently occurred with your program. And I'm going to switch back to Grok view if I can. Um, here we have the different Grok chip functional units also highlighted in different colors to show you exactly what functional unit of the Grok chip is being used, um, the utilization percentage, and at which cycle. Uh, Andrew Batar in day one of this workshop went over what the functional units of the Grok chip are, and we will have uh, these slides available for you to go back and check to learn more or to just refresh yourself on what these are. Okay, so moving on. So in that same stats mode, um, next to plots where we just checked out utilization, which is already uh, selected by default. 
we have this power panel. So this uh, dynamic power is calculated based on the instruction um, of your program's known charge and dissipation power. Um, and this power graph uses a leakage power that assumes that the Grok chip is kept at 65 degrees Celsius. Now, if you scroll down a little bit, if you're following along with me, we'll have the instructions view within the stats mode. So here, um, the instructions are broken down and all of them uh, are identified according to which group they're part of. And the group is really just, once again, the functional blocks within the Grok chip. Uh, the percentage that you see here is a count divided by the total number of instructions. Um, and each time an instruction occurs, this count is just increased. Um, so with these metrics, uh, really the idea here is to use them to optimize your program. Um, and as an example, uh, if this report shows that the majority of the program's instructions um, for your model were for reads and writes to memory, a potential improvement could be to chain computation together to take advantage of the streaming architecture and boost your performance. Now, something that's in the works um, is an optimization guide that we will have available um, in the next few releases where we will give you tips and tricks um, and pointers for optimizing your models uh, by looking at the information that we have available with Grok View. And last but not least in stats mode, um, we have a display all the way at the end if you scroll down for stream issues. In this case, for this example, we have none. Um, so if there are any stream issues, just like the screenshot on the right, uh, it will display the stream issues um, and in which section they occur. So for this example, uh, it's saying that there are stream conflicts starting at cycle 412 and then lasting for an additional 23 cycles. So um, this will tell you before even deploying if you have any problems with your program. And that's it for stats. Uh, that's mode, we are moving on to the second out of the four modes that we have called container mode. So, and let me go back to Grok view to show you that. So if you click on this icon here, you will see container mode. So container mode displays the hierarchical organization and duration of each container, where a container is a group of instructions, basically, that occur together in your Grok program. Um, Grok programs are composed of these instructions, and to help understand how these instructions relate to each other, uh, Grok View provides um, this mechanism, the container mode, for organizing these instructions into containers to make it easier for your development. So just to go over the UI features here, we have in the middle pane what we call a timeline. So this provides your container structure in time represented as cycles and depicted um, at the top right here. Uh, I don't know if this is too small to see, so I'll switch over here. But as you can see for this program, uh, the cycle count is 371. The outline on the right side, once again, we have that shows the hierarchical organization of the program as containers. On the left, we have a, an option called show all containment. So as you can see right now, um, the containers are organized as lines. You can just do this, show all containment, um, to toggle a container view so that it's easier to see. And then last but not least, um, we have three options in this palette um, to make it easier to view whichever color you like, you can select here um, to see in this container mode. Okay. And then that's it for the container mode. And I'm just going to look at the chat to make sure that there are no questions. There aren't any, but if you have any, please write them down. Um, the third out of our four modes is schedule mode with Grok View. So schedule mode displays the information for each instruction in your program 
including when in time the instruction is scheduled, how long it takes, and then where in the chip it actually occurs. So once again, this middle portion is called the timeline. So it'll show when and which cycle and where in the Grok chip, so which functional unit that instruction is scheduled in. Um, the time is depicted here along the vertical axis with cycle zero at the top and then the last cycle of the program at the bottom, which in this case, this screenshot is from a different program because I want to show you uh, more of what's really going on in schedule mode uh, since the hello world example that we use together today uh, is a very fairly small example that doesn't have as much going on. Um, and then here to the right, we have the mini map. So this mini map really just shows you um, where you are because for bigger programs, uh, you may have to, you know, scroll down. There could be a lot going on, as you can see here. Um, so this gray box in the mini map uh, indicates where you are in the program. And then to zoom, uh, you can simply just use control and scroll into zoom and then pan around the diagram. You can click and drag on the timeline. So let me just go to that um, here, schedule mode. And as you can see live, what's right here. Okay, and I'm just zooming in so that we can hopefully see something here. There we go. Okay, so what you sort of just saw me do, um, and you probably saw that arrow right there, and I'm going to zoom out so we can see. This is the instruction connectivity. So when you select an instruction, like I just did right now, um, the subgraph of the connected instructions is visible for you. Um, so right here, for example, I selected this one. Once you select um, one of these instructions um, on the chip, It'll also update on the left-hand panel, this program view to show you more information. So under instruction, for example, um, this instruction is taking place um, in the memory unit uh, in the West. Uh, it's a read instruction. And then its container is the add container that we have right here. Um, and then it occurs at cycle 229. So it gives you some good information um, for you to really see all those interesting and exciting details of what's actually going on on your Grok chip before you even run it on Grok chip. So that's something I really wanna highlight here. This is during your development cycle as a developer where you don't have to go through that entire iteration of, I need to compile, I need to um, iterate over my model, I need to deploy it, I need to run it. So this takes, um, that process out of uh, that part out of this process um, and really just lets you focus on development, know exactly how your program is going to run, what the exact performance is, what's going on, what will be going on on the Grok chip before you even deploy your model, which is really exciting. Okay, and then with that, we're actually on our last mode which is streams mode. So this is one of my favorites. Um, streams mode provides a view of the flow of data on streams to help identify any conflicts. Um, so Grok chip in particular, and I think we may have gone over this before, provides 64 streams for data movement, 32 traveling eastward and 32 traveling westward. And I think I see a question in Q&A. Bill asks, is there support in GrokView for models that use more than one chip? Yes, there actually is um, support for that. And I will, let me provide more written detail um, to you in the chat in a bit. Okay. So with that, let's go over the UI features for streams mode. So at the top, and I will, um, I guess, demo this after I go over uh, this slide. We have a cycle slider slider bar. So here um, you can actually press play and have these different um, options of slow, medium, or fast um, to show you uh, a step through of your program um, so that you can observe the state of each stream at each cycle until the last cycle in your Grok program. 
Um, here we have a minus one and plus one uh, buttons. This will allow you to increment or um, increment or decrement the cycle count by one when you click them. Um, otherwise, by default, it just goes by one. The stream traversal. So as you can see right here, uh, at cycle zero, this shows the functional units that streams will traverse through. So um, this is a little bit hard to see, so I will show you in the actual Grok view I have open. But once again, we have our Grok to functional units uh, listed here, and you will be able to see your data uh, traverse through those functional units, whichever ones that your program requires. Once again, in this mode, instruction information, if you hover over um, any of the instructions that we will see in a bit, uh, it will give you more information on the left hand panel, like so. And then unit information um, and stream inv information. Once again, if you hover over any of the units, um, you will get more information in the left hand panel. So let me go through and show you the stream. Okay, so I'm going to press play. Once again, this example is kind of a simple, a very simple example. So there's not a lot going on, but here, as you can see, so this is um, an instruction. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that. This is an example of an instruction that's in the program. Um, and we're going to see this traverse through the Grok chip. So I'm going to play that. And then as you can see, they're all moving and you are allowed to pause this at any time. So for example, I have paused it here and then I can go ahead and hover over this to see that, for example, this is the data that's produced by the VXM at cycle 219. And it's intended to move towards the West memory 34. So, which is where it's heading if I press play right there. So this is um, a very fun, in my opinion, uh, mode that we have, and not just fun, uh, very functional and useful to see what's actually going on at which cycle to determine if there are any stream conflicts to be able to optimize your programs once you see how it's actually moving on the chip itself before you deploy or run your models. Okay. And similar to stats mode, um, where we saw that it will report a stream issue, uh, streams mode will also show you if there are any stream issues as well. Okay, with that, that was actually all I had for Grok view. Um, if there are any other questions, let me know. If not, I'm going to move on to the IOP file utility. But hopefully um, that served as, um, you know, an informational presentation on what exactly Grokview is. You were introduced to it in previous sessions. Um, and now hopefully you have more information on what you can do with it. Okay. Okay, I see a question um, from Richard. What am I looking for in this besides stream issues and how do I map an issue back to a line of PyTorch? That is a great question. And I'm going to reserve to um, answer you by typing this out uh, later. So I will move on, um, but I will definitely come back to you for this and type out my answer, same with Bill. All right, so with that, let's move on to our second um, developer tool that we have available for you. This is the IOP file utility. Um, as I explained before, this is also part of the Grok Dev Tools uh, package. This is just a simple command line tool to extract the metadata um, from the input output program files. So we have gone over what an IOP or input output program file is. This tool can extract the metadata for you, um, which includes information about the number of cycles the model takes to execute, the usage of the various functional blocks within the Grok chip, and then the inputs and outputs expected. Um, 
to learn more about this, if you're logged into the server, you can simply run IOP-utils-help um, to view the options. This is, and I'm mentioning this tool mainly because um, if you remember in Rockflow, we have a bunch of examples, but when you are developing your own models, you need to make sure that your input data for the compiled models are formatted as NumPy arrays and then that the input sizes uh, match the inputs and sizes expected by your IOP files. Um, if you're unsure of what these inputs or sizes are uh, for any reason, it's very easy to simply uh, give IOP utils your IOP file path and then go ahead and use one of its options such as stats here um, or it has an inputs option to see what inputs um, and sizes your IOP file expects from you. So I mainly use IOP file utility in this way uh, for developing with Grokflow. And then I could I could um give a quick just show you guys. So this is the help menu, and then here um I can go ahead and I think I think I gave a I'm not sure where the okay. I think live coding is not my thing. I'm trying to get to, no. I want to give an IOP file from the hidden cache. It's in the, in the home drawer, tilde slash. Tilde slash. Dot cache. Dot, dot cache. Thank you, Bill. Awesome. Okay, so here, as you can see, because we built our um, Hello PyTorch world model, we have this directory in the, the cache directory. And in here, if we go into, I believe it's compile. Yeah, we have our IOP file. So into IOP utils, I'm going to use, let's say, um, metadata. And then give it the or not that one so this is a really small model that we're uh playing with so i'm trying to see maybe it was io there we go okay so um just as an example we had our hello world example with pytorch uh i passed that into iop utils um using the io option and here it'll show me what inputs are expected and its outputs. So this is just um, one way in which I use this tool, the live demo. So moving on, uh, last but not least, I want to mention TFP control utility. So this is a command line tool to actually interact with your Grok hardware, um, including options to check the status of the available cards in your system, uh, any power readings, card statuses, and etc. This is mainly used as a debugging tool, but I wanted to mention this because um, I've gotten a lot of questions from researchers um, and others uh, just inquiring about, let's say, board temperature um, and details like that. So we actually have a very simple uh, tool, which is TSP control utility that has a monitor option. Um, so this monitor option actually gives us that information. So I'm going to just show you that very quickly. And we have a whole uh, bunch of other options um, that you can use with the TSP control utility. And let me just demonstrate um, here with its help menu. A lot of these, hopefully you will not have to uh, touch at all, but I thought monitor would be one that we would all be interested in. So I'm just going to go ahead and show that. Yeah, so on my system, uh, I just have one lonely 
rock chip uh, for, for this demonstration. But uh, as you can see, um, monitor will give you the board temperature um, uh, in Celsius, the power dissipation, the IDD, and the IDD peak. And I can provide, if you are interested, more information um, about the uh, the power dissipation, the IDD, and all of that in a sort of a user guide. So if there's any interested in that um, for chip, you know, uh, power consumption, um, let me know. Maybe say in the chat that you're interested in, and I'd be happy to share more information about that um, written information after this workshop's over. Oh, and with that, we're at the end of this session. So this is um, going to be available to you. So you'll be able to click into all of these links, but we have a bunch of resources um, for how-to videos and any webinars. Um, we have a lot of interesting talks on there as well. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. Um, so it's at Grok Inc. Uh, feel free to visit that. There are also many informational videos about our developer tools, um, you know, just beyond this session, if you're interested. Uh, we have a Grok support portal. So if you go to support.grok.com, you can sign up there for support. And we have, um, it's gated uh, because you will have to create an account, but we do have more documentation available on there. But I would advise that for your uh, purposes, you can just get onto our Grok GitHub. Everything is open source on their Grok Flow, ML Agility, which you'll mainly be interested in. Um, we have code examples, models, as Sanjeev um, really nicely showed us yesterday. You can just start your exploration of Grok, um, I think, on the Grok Flow GitHub page. Uh, we have a Grok resources page as well with research papers. If you're interested in doing a little bit of reading, um, that is on our Grok homepage. So I've added all these links here for you um, that you can take a look at. And then of course, uh, if you have any questions at all, don't hesitate. Uh, you can reach out to us. You can follow us on Twitter um, if you, or I guess it's called X now, whatever, whatever you have, whatever you want to call it. And then you can also connect with us on LinkedIn. 